to the book of Joel. J-O-E-L, let you look for it. Oh, it's in your table of contents. And if you don't want to, take my word for it. It's just one verse. It's chapter 3, book of Joel. And I think it speaks volumes. As Larry mentioned, we got the virus. We've had got this election upheaval, and it's not over yet. It's going on and going on. And we've got people quarantined, and we've got people that are not quarantined, and we've got people who think they ought to be quarantined, and we've got, <laughs> got people who think you or you or you ought to be, but not me, you know. And Here's the problem. It says in this verse, multitudes, that means a lot. And it says it twice, which means that's a real lot. In the valley of decision... The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Amen. Father God, tonight we come again thanking you so much. Thank you for this tremendous day. Thank you, Father, for the message you gave us this morning, using our brother to deliver it. Thank you, Father, for the way you continue to speak to us. Every time we bother to show up, you're here. Tonight, Father, I believe it's the same thing. I believe that you're here because we're here, and we're here because you're here. Tonight, Father, we're just asking you once again to take charge. Let your word go forth and perform that which you've sent it to do. And we'll give you all the glory and praise and honor and thanksgiving because, Lord, you are God. Amen, amen and amen. You know, <clears throat> if people would take the time, read that whole third chapter. I mean, come on, you know, I could say that about every chapter, but this in particular, it, it, you, you couldn't help but see that when he talks about the valley of decision, he's talking about a place, and I, I hope you see the parallel, where the heathen nations, under the direction of the spirit of the Antichrist, come together for one final confrontation that they think will forever obliterate, obliterate the nation of Israel and the Jews from the face of the earth. In fact, it's God himself who brings them into this valley. It's also called back in verse 12, the valley of Jehoshaphat, one giant final battle. We also call that the battle of Armageddon. Armageddon. But I didn't come tonight, and I hope you didn't, to talk about prophecy, talk about end time judgments, even though those are incredibly important at this time. I want us to look at what's happening right now in the Valley of Decision. It wasn't enough for the devil to try and kill Jesus. It won't be enough that the Antichrist will persecute those who worship anything or anyone other than him, trying to bring down and slaughter anything that opposes him. It's not enough that he wants every living human being on the face of the earth on the brink of total annihilation, because you understand this, and I think we overlook it and we get smug about it as Christians. Satan will never stop. He'll never be satisfied. He'll never stop doing all he can to utterly destroy everything that reminds him that he is not God. Amen. Even though he's already defeated, he doesn't stop. Even though he's been kicked out of heaven, he's been stifled and frustrated on every effort he's made to destroy God's creation, he's had judgment pronounced on him, he's still deluded and deceived by his own pride and his own heart and believes that he can still defeat God. So, as part of that all-out effort to destroy humanity, his goal is to bring each and every one of us individually and collectively, into the valley of decision to see if he can trick us into following him and denying God. I don't understand, Bonnie, how we can look at, if nothing else, just this year. 
and stand up and say, oh, I'm not going to believe in any God to let this happen. Brandon, I, I'm going to believe in the God who's going to get me through this happening. <laughs> Satan knows that he can hit us at our lowest point and, and when our strength is gone and we're totally discouraged and hope is declining, then he just might be able to steal one more soul away from God. All of humanity today is in that valley of decision only because we have chosen to live in rebellion against the Lord God of heaven. It started back, and you know where it started in the beginning. Back in that garden, mankind made a decision through Adam to disobey God. And all of us are in that same condition of rebellion tonight. I thought you were going to go there this morning. And just flat out tell us, you know, we were in rebellion. As a result, that means every one of us is in the valley of, the de of decision. Our own individual valley. Time and time again, we're reminded that we're still living in a sinful world. And that sin does have an effect on us. Therefore, we either have to repent or know that judgment for that sin is coming. God's warnings are clear if anybody wants to see them. No one's going to be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know what I was doing. God sees the heart, and he sees the heart that won't walk with him by faith. He knows our minds, and he knows exactly why we do the things that we do that are rebellious against him. I know, I know there's times when he allows us to go through the valley it's just to prove our faith and test our commitment. But I'm also convinced that if we didn't have a heart that had the ability to rebel in the first place, there'd be no need for these valleys for us to go through. Most of the time, that we walk through the valleys, they're valleys of our own making. Because we want to walk in ways that are contrary to God's ways. Oh man, the point I'm trying to make is that when we're in the valley of decision is not the time to walk away from our only hope of coming out. We should never give in to our emotions or our feelings or our doubts or our fears. In the valley is where we can just hold on to God, walk by faith, not by sight. That's the only way we'll ever get out of that valley. Amen. You see, when that, when that day comes that Joel was talking about, when mankind enters that valley on that day, that's when God is going to pass his final judgment on any rebellion against him. It's going to be what's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. Jesus comes back to take vengeance on all those who oppose him. Amen. What a terrible thing that's going to be, church, if we could just get it in here. Just think about Revelation 14, 20. It talks about the carnage in that valley on that day. It says those who fight against God, their blood is going to be as deep as the horse's bridles and go run up to 1,600 furlongs. That's approximately 184 miles. And I don't care if you got a Shetland pony. That's a lot of blood. And I know there's people going to say, that's not literal, Bob. That's not, that's just, that's just a hyperbole. That's just something to exaggerate. So you have an example so you can get a context of how, how awful it's going to be and how universal it's going to be. It doesn't matter whether it's literal or, or symbolic. It's still 
powerful example. Let's just do it this way. Let's just go ahead and make it personal. What kind of valleys do we face in our own lives? How do we get there? And most importantly, when we do get there, when we're in that valley, how do we get out? It's just where we may face a place where we have become totally depressed. Yeah, Christians become depressed because of finances and health problems and habits we can't seem to break and circumstances that aren't going the way we think they ought to go. And you know, just pick your own reason, but there's only three kinds of people when it comes to the valley of decision. That narrows it down. You got people who are about to go in there. You got people who are already in there. And you got people who have just reached the top of the hill coming out and seeing the next one. God allows this to happen to us for a reason. Romans 1.17 says, Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It's written, the just shall live by faith. It's only in the valley that we're going to grow in faith. It's only in the valley. You understand what valleys are like. You can't see what's on the outside. You don't know what's going on around you. You can't feel. You can't understand. You cannot get a grip and with your mind on the hand of God. You don't know what he's doing. And so you don't know what God's doing. So you let yourself get into confusion. And you look at there's nothing but seems like closed doors everywhere you look. And if we're not careful to hold on to God, we're going to make wrong choices. And that only makes it worse. It drives us deeper into the valley. And it's sad to say that the majority of professing Christians who walk away from the church, who walk away from Jesus, go back to the world of sin, made that decision when they were in a valley. They don't realize the valley is not the time to turn your back on God. <laughs> He's their only hope. He's their only help. And they walk away and they face the devil on his own terms. And they're weakened spiritually. The end result is that they fall back into their old lifestyles and they follow the things of the world and the devil puts it before them and he's got them back. Do you understand? I know you do if you think about it. How many opportunities every one of us has consistently to go back to where we came from? I don't know about you, church, but that just scares the daylights out of me. I know where he brought me from. And to think that I could so easily go back to that pit. I don't understand. If you <laughs> Satan promises the world. But in the end, all we're going to get is hell's flames. Yeah. Hebrews 10.38 says, The just will live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. It's in the valley is not the time to bail out on the church, turn your back on the Lord, and run right back into the arms of the devil who's waiting. <clears throat> it's time to hold on. Keep pressing forward. Put your faith in God because he'll bring you out. There's an interesting thing I read in a book, and, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you know who Robert Schuler is? Okay. He, he wrote a book called Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Do. And he, he talks about his dad giving him an example of a winter in which his father was out cutting firewood in the snow, and he found what he thought was a dead tree, and so he cut it off, all down, brought it in the house, used it, and the next spring he saw shoots coming out of the where that tree had been left. And he said, I thought it was dead. The branches were brittle and everything was going on. And he says, here's what he said, don't forget this. <clears throat> First of all, I'll never cut down a tree in the wintertime. 
Never make a negative decision in the low time. Never make your most important decisions when you're in your worst mood. Wait, be patient, the storm will pass, the spring will come. And we all make wrong decisions. If you say you don't make wrong decisions, we're going to have time for you to come down to the altar later and talk to him about that. And it, but making decisions that are neg negative when you're in the valley is a very dangerous thing to do. We don't make intelligent decisions because we can't see all the facts. We can't see all the reasons that trouble's going on. We can't see what's on the other side. We don't know which way to turn. We can't see the hand of God moving in our behalf. We can't seem to touch heaven with our prayers. We can't see the way out because it's hidden by our own doubts and fears and even sometimes unrepented sin. Sometimes the best thing to do when you don't know what to do is to do absolutely nothing. Stand still. See what God's doing. Give God a chance to bring you out. What have you got to lose by waiting on the Lord? What that, remember Isaiah 40, 31? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. If we just hold on to God, wait on Him, trust in Him, believe in Him, we're going to mount up with wings like eagles. If we believe, and I believe, that if we mount up with wings, Sooner or later, we're going to come soaring out of that valley, above all the clouds of doubt and fear, into the clear light of God's glory once again. Yeah. <clears throat> A writer named David Russell said, The hardest thing to learn in life is which bridge to cross and which bridge to burn. And it's doubly true when you're at a low point in your life. And it, 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 you don't have to take my word for it. We see people all throughout the Bible who made wrong choices when they were in the valley, and some of them were able to overcome. And some of them just kept on making wrong choices until it cost them not only their lives, but their very souls. You remember King Saul? Head and shoulders above all of Israel. Good looking. Whew. But he became as a result of his choices, a rejected king. And David was anointed to take his place. He could have turned, Saul could have turned around at any point, fallen on his face in repentance. He could have killed Goliath himself if he just trusted in God. But instead, he chose, he chose, he chose to go to the witch of Endor. <laughs> and he brought judgment on his own life and his, high, and his entire family. What about Judas? Do you remember the fact that Judas was one of the twelve? When, when Jesus sent them out and told them all these things to do, heal the sick, raise the dead, all, Judas was one of them? He was in that Bunch. He had that ability. But he got into that valley because of greed. And, and he really didn't trust Jesus. He could have turned back in repentance even after he sold Jesus out. Jesus, I believe with all my heart, would have forgiven Judas if he had just asked. But he kept on making wrong choices when he knew he had sinned. Yeah, he was sorry, more sorry, but not sorry enough. But he was convinced that he couldn't do anything about it, so he eventually committed suicide. What about somebody who we know was in there? What about Peter? I like Peter. I can relate to Peter. Somebody spends most of your time with your foot in your mouth. I can relate to Peter, all right? 
But he was deep in depression. He was in fear. He was in doubt. Jesus was arrested. He had just declared he was going to die for him. And now he's arrested. And now he's afraid. And he even denied knowing who he was. When that rooster crowed, Peter had a decision to make. And he was about as low as a man could go. What to do? Where to go? Who to turn to? Peter made the choice to hold on to God. He repented of his sin, and later he preached the gospel and saw 3,000 souls saved on the day of Pentecost. You remember Paul? Remember him? We talk a lot about poor old Paul. We pick on him so much. Do you think he had any valid decisions to make? He said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness and painfulness and watchings office, hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside all that, I worry about the church every day. Don't you think there were times when he had trouble and distress that he was, knew he was in a valley and had to make a decision? You know what he did, though? The goofy guy kept on going, no matter what, right up to the end of his life. And listen to what he said in 2 Timothy 4, 6. I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered. That means he was ready to be a sacrifice. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, finished my course, kept the faith. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not for me only, but all of them that love his appearing. That's us! What made the difference between Saul and Judas and Peter and Paul was that they came out of the valley victorious. They decided to continue serving the Lord through all of it. Do you think, how many of you have been serving the Lord longer than 40 years? Have there been any times in that plus 40 years that you've wondered why do I keep doing this to myself? They never gave up. They just kept on going in the face of adversity. Winston Churchill, you're, somebody knows who he was, Prime Minister of England during World War II. He made a speech after the war, and the thing that he said in that speech I want to highlight is never give up. Never give up. That's our answer. If you're in the valley of decision and the devil is screaming in your ear that you're never going to make it, nobody cares anymore, God's not listening, the church has failed you, you are unworthy, just remember, the devil's a liar. Amen. And he's the father of lies. Never give up. Hold on to the Lord Jesus Christ. Throw yourself at his feet. Turn to him. Wait on him. He won't fail you. You'll come out of this valley of decision and you'll be victorious on the other side. And people are going to wonder, how did you do that? And there's your perfect opening. God will bring you out. Just don't give up. Somehow. And I don't know how and you don't need to know how. God will make a way. Just don't give up on him. Well, he didn't do it my way. Aha. If you're in a valley right now with decisions to make, just don't give up on Jesus. You see what? When you can't feel him, he's still there. And when you can't hear him, he still hears you. And when you feel like you're lost, he knows exactly where you are. Even when you don't think you can make it. And a church, I've seen times and I've seen people go through times when they said, I just can't 
do this anymore. Jesus is standing right there to cheer you on and help you over. Don't ever give up on God. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, tonight we come once again, Lord, just rejoicing in the fact that we that you